Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I would like to call to the stage for speaker for the evening, Yasir Qadi. Yasir Qadi will be speaking on the subject of the power of repentance, be courageous. Ladies and gentlemen, Yasir Qadi was born in Houston, Texas. He completed his primary and secondary education in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. He finished his Hibs of Quran at an early age and completed a Bachelor of Science in the University of Houston in chemical engineering. After completing his studies in the University of Houston, he was accepted into the Islamic University of Medina, also in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. At the Islamic University of Medina, he pursued a Bachelor's of Arts degree in Hadith from the College of Hadith and Islamic Sciences and followed it up with a Master's in Islamic Theology from the College of Dawah. He is currently a doctoral candidate at Yale University and is residing in New Haven, Connecticut. Yasir Qadi is frequently seen and heard both through the radio, television, and internet. He's also written to a few books and some booklets, some of which I'll mention. Ria Hidden Shirk, An Introduction to the Sciences of the Quran, and booklets Asma bint Abi Bakr, Safiya bint Abdul Mutalib. Ladies and gentlemen, Yasir Qadi mentioned to you last night that he is the only foreigner who is not a foreigner. His family originally hails from India, Lucknow, and some of you may be familiar with the area. At this moment, I would like to welcome to you your brother and mine, Yasir Qadi, speaking on the title of Repentance. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Verily, all praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We praise Him and we seek His help. And we seek Allah's forgiveness from the evil of our souls and the consequences of our actions. Indeed, whomever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides, there is none who can misguide Him. And whoever He misguides, none can guide Him back to the straight path. I bear witness and I testify that there is no deity that is worthy of our worship other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I bear witness and I testify that Muhammad ibn Abdullah al-Qurashi al-Hashimi al-Arabi is his final messenger and his most perfect worshipper. As to what follows, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, I want you to close your eyes for a second and remember, think about the latest sin that you have done, the latest act of disobedience, the latest act that made you feel guilty for doing that act. And ask yourself, how recent was this act? How long ago did I commit this act? And if we, all of us, are truthful in this response, there is not a single person sitting here today, except that he or she will be able to think of something they have done today. In fact, in the last few hours, Brothers and sisters, the reality and the fact of the matter is that each and every one of us is a sinner. Is a sinner, disobedient sinner. We sin by disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala constantly. We sin by day and we sin by night. We sin with our hands and we sin with our feet. We sin with our tongues and we sin with our eyes. In fact, hardly a portion of a day goes by except that we do something that we should not do, or we fail to do something that we should have done. So much so, so much so, that many of us, and this is the worst of all of the things, many of us even fail to register the fact that we are committing a sin. The sin becomes a part of our life. It becomes a part of our habit. We do sins like we eat and drink. We do it as a part of our daily routine, not even registering that a sin has been committed. Some of the early scholars of Islam, some of the Sahaba, when they saw the status of the Tabi'un, the Tabi'un are the second generation of Islam. When one of the Sahaba, Anas ibn Malik, when he saw how the second generation had strayed from the first, he said, I see you committing sins 
I see you committing sins that you consider to be less weighty than the hair on your head. You consider to be like a hair. If we had done the same sin in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu we would have thought we were destroyed. If this is Anas ibn Malik talking about the second generation of Islam, let me ask you, what do you think Anas ibn Malik would say if he were to see us here today? What do you think he would say when the majority of us don't even pray five times a day? When the majority of us have our money somehow tainted with haram? When the majority of us are committing not just minor but major sins on a routine basis? What do you think he or those of his times or even more so, what do you think the Prophet ﷺ would have said? Brothers and sisters, one of the companions who lived a long age, when he saw the status of society around him, he said, I don't recognize anything of what you do as being of Islam except your prayers. And even that you are changing, he said. I don't recognize your lifestyles. I don't recognize your characters. I don't recognize your emotions. I don't recognize what you are doing and what you are avoiding as being a part of Islam, except for the prayers, he said. And that even in our times, the prayer has been something that is almost abandoned by the majority of us. Brothers and sisters in Islam, it is high time that we think about how we are living our lives, what we are doing in this life that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. One of the famous companions, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala an, he said, the example of a believer with regards to his sins, pay attention to this example, it's beautiful. The example of a believer with regards to his sins is that he thinks that he is a person sitting under a large mountain, that's his sins. And he is scared the mountain will collapse and destroy him. The believer sees his sins like a mountain and that mountain will destroy him. And he said the example of the munafiq, of the hypocrite, of the evil person, the example of the evil person with his sins is that he sees his sins like flies that buzz around his face. All the, that he has to do is move his hands and the flies will go away. So the munafiq trivializes the sins that he does and he considers them to be like the flies he just brushes and they will fly away whereas the believer aggrandizes the sins sees the sins as being much bigger than they are now let me ask you a question who does more sins the pious believer or the hypocrite there is no doubt the hypocrite does more sins the believer does far fewer sins and yet the believer takes those small sins that he does and he considers it like a mountain. And the hypocrite, he does huge sins, massive sins, and he considers them to be trivial like flies. The question is, and I ask myself this question and I ask you as well, how do I view my sins and how do you view your sins? Do you view them like flies that you just have to brush them away, ignore them? When you think about them, you change the topic? You just ignore and blank out? Or do you view them like a mountain that you have to account for? And this will give you the character, it will give you the category you fall into. O Muslims, the Prophet ﷺ warned us even against the minor sins. He said, the minor sins pile up like twigs like small branches and indeed a pile of small branches can give a very strong fire what happens when you have hundreds of twigs hundreds and thousands of small branches it will become a huge mound that will give you a huge fire each one of them you consider trivial but when you add it and add it and add it and more and more what happens that is why the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said any time allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks any person about these trivial sins, that city is destroyed. Anytime Allah asks you about these trivial sins, the sins you consider minor, you have no hope then, because if you're going to be accounted for all of the trivial sins, then you have no way you're going to save yourself from the wrath of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What then is the solution? What is the way out? There must be an exit. This exit 
This solution has been very clearly emphasized in the Quran and in the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ said, Every single son of Adam is a sinner. Every single son of Adam is a sinner. You cannot be a human being except if you commit sins. If you didn't commit sins, you would be angels. If you did not commit sins, you would not be human anymore. You would become angels. It is the angels who do not commit sins. As for human beings, it is impossible for a human being to reach the level of perfection where he abandons sins. It's not possible. You are human and humans are bound to err. To err is human indeed, it is true. That's exactly what the Prophet ﷺ said. Every single human being is a sinner. But then what? If we're all sinners, is that it? We're all going to be the same? No. The Prophet ﷺ emphasized, and the best of sinners. Aha, so there is a best. There is a good category. There is levels of sinners. Not all sinners are the same level. The Prophet ﷺ said, the best of them. We are all going to sin. There is a best category. The best of sinners are those who repent. Repentance. Tawbah. This is the solution. This is the exit. This is the means of cleansing the sins that we have committed. There is no other solution, no other exit path except for this path of Tawbah. And that is why Tawbah is not an option for us. Tawbah is not a voluntary act for us. Tawbah is obligatory and not optional. Tawbah is mandatory upon each and every Muslim, each and every human being. Tawbah is something that we are required to do. It is not an option. When we know we are all sinners, when we know that every one of us is going to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the only way out of this is to cleanse ourselves through the cleansing of repentance. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to repent. وَتُوبُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا أَيُّهَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ All of you should repent to Allah. جَمِيعًا Each and every one of you. If you wish to be successful. يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا O you who believe. This verse is addressed to me and you. Each and every Muslim. O you who believe. تُوبُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ تَوْبَةً نَصُوحًا Repent to Allah a sincere repentance. Repent to Allah a full and true repentance. In this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala emphasizes the fact that even repentance is of many types. There is a true repentance. There is a sincere repentance. And Allah commands us to go to that type of repentance. Repent to Allah in the best of all ways. Brothers and sisters, if repentance is obligatory upon all human beings, this means that even the prophets of Allah had to repent. And that is exactly what we find. Do you know that even the prophets of Allah, all of them, they had to seek Allah's forgiveness. Our father Adam alayhi salam, the first human being, the first human being, our father Adam, he did something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him not to do. He ate of the tree that Allah said, do not eat from it. Iblis, he disobeyed Allah when Allah commanded him. When Allah said to prostrate to Adam, Iblis said no. So both of them disobeyed, Adam and Iblis. But let me ask you, are they the same? Are they at the same level? A'udhu billah, of course not. Why? Why? When both of them disobeyed, why are they not at the same level? Because as for our father Adam, فَتَلَقَّى آدَمُ مِنْ رَبِّهِ كَلِمَاتٍ فَتَابَ عَلَيْهِ قَالَ رَبَّنَا ظَلَمْنَا أَنفُسَنَا وَإِنْ لَمْ تَغْفِرْ لَنَا وَتَرْحَمْنَا لَنَكُونَنَّ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ Adam repented. Adam said, Oh Allah, I have committed a sin. Oh Allah, if you don't forgive me, if you don't have mercy on me, I will be of those who are destroyed. And as for Iblis, أَبَى وَاسْتَكْبَرَ وَكَانَ مِنَ الْكَافِرِينَ Iblis became arrogant and rejected and was of the kafirin. Adam repented and so Allah accepted it from him and forgave him and Adam became a prophet of Allah. Iblis did not repent. Iblis rejected and was arrogant 
And so Iblis became the most accursed of Allah's creation. The Prophet Nuh alayhi salam, the Prophet Nuh alayhi salam also asked Allah for something he should not have asked for. He asked Allah to save his son and Allah had clearly told him, do not ask anyone to be saved who is not a Muslim and his son was not a Muslim. So when he asked Allah for something he should not have asked, Nuh alayhi salam repented. Oh Allah, if you don't forgive me, if you don't have mercy on me, I will be of those who are destroyed. This is the Prophet Nuh alayhi salam repenting to Allah. Ibrahim and Ismail, when they are building the Kaaba, while they are building the holiest structure on earth, they make a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَتُبْ عَلَيْنَا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ التَّوَابُ الرَّحِيمُ Forgive us and accept our repentance. Allow us to be of those who repent and accept it. You are the one who accepts the repentance and you are the one who forgives. Musa alayhi salam, when he asked to see Allah, and he should not have asked this because he knows, as all the prophets do, that Allah cannot be seen. When he awoke from the coma that he fell into, فَلَمَّا أَفَاقَ قَالَ سُبْحَانَكَ تُبْتُ إِلَيْكَ وَأَنَا أَوَّلُ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Musa alayhi salam says, Oh Allah, Subhanak, how exalted are you? I am guilty. I turn to you in repentance. Musa was not ashamed to repent to Allah. And how about our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam? Someone whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forgiven each and every sin. اللَّهُ لَكَ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِن ذَنْبِكَ وَمَا تَأَخَّرَ Allah says in the Quran, each and every sin of yours, we have forgiven it. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a hadith in Sahih Bukhari, Indeed, I repent to Allah every single day more than 100 times. 100 times I seek Allah's forgiveness every single day. Let me ask you brothers and sisters, who do you think is more in need of Allah's mercy? Us sinful people or the holiest of all men, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? The answer is obvious. We are more in need of Allah's mercy. So then the question is, if the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would seek Allah's forgiveness 100 times a day, how often do you think we need to be seeking Allah's forgiveness? Oh Muslims, as we said, tawbah is not an option. It is an obligation. Tawbah is fard. It is obligatory upon every single Muslim, every single day of his life. And anybody who reads the Quran and Sunnah cannot help but be overwhelmed by the mercy of Allah, by the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to repent. And then he tells us about how merciful he is. In one verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, وَمَنْ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ Who can forgive your sins other than Allah? In another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَهُوَ الَّذِي يَقْبَلُ التَّوْبَةَ عَنْ عِبَادِهِ وَيَعْفُ عَنِ السَّيِّئَاتِ Allah is the one who accepts your repentance and forgives your sins. In yet another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O you who believe, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا O you who believe, O you who have committed sins, Allah is addressing the sinners. O oh, you who have committed sins against your own souls, do not despair of the mercy of Allah. Indeed, Allah can forgive all sins. In fact, we all know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has many names. Of them are 99 that are extra special. And most of these names center around the concept of mercy and forgiveness. Ponder over the names of Allah. Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim, the one who has mercy and the ever-merciful. Al-Ghaffar and Al-Ghafoor, the one who forgives and the one who will be able to remit all of your sins. Al-Afu, the one who erases. At-Tawwab, the one who causes you to repent and then accepts that repentance. So many of Allah's names and attributes center around the concept of mercy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us in the Quran, and the Prophet reminds us in the Sunnah about how magnificent is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet said in one hadith, 
that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stretches out his hands in the day to accept the repentance of the one who sinned in the night. And Allah stretches out his hand in the night to accept the repentance of the one who sinned during the day. So much so, so great is the mercy of Allah that the Prophet ﷺ even said, if a non-Muslim only knew how much mercy Allah has, even he would not give up hope of entering Jannah. If a non-Muslim knew and realized how much mercy Allah has, even he would be enthused with optimism that perhaps, perhaps I can enter Jannah as well. And Shaytan himself, Shaytan challenged Allah. When Shaytan was expelled from Jannah, Shaytan challenged Allah. And Shaytan said, I swear by your honor, Shaytan is swearing by Allah's honor. Wa izzatika, I swear by you, O Allah, I will misguide each and every one of them. All of us he's talking about. As long as they have a spirit within their bodies. What was the response of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? I will misguide each and every one of them. This is my duty now. This is what Shaytan said. This is what I want to do. Each and every one I want to misguide. Allah said, and I swear by my own izzah that I will continue to forgive them as long as they turn to me in repentance. You do what you want. I will continue to forgive as long as they turn to me and ask me in repentance. Allah Himself asks us to repent to Him. أَفَلَا يَتُوبُونَ إِلَى اللَّهِ Why don't they repent to Allah? Why don't they seek Allah's forgiveness? For Allah is ghafoor and rahim. Allah tells us in the Quran, if you repent, it is for your own good. فَإِنْ يَتُوبُوا يَكُوا خَيْرًا لَهُمْ If you do tawbah, it is for your own good. Allah says in the Quran, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُبَيِّنَ لَكُمْ وَيَهْدِيَكُمْ سُنَنَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ وَيَتُوبَ عَلَيْكُمْ Allah wants to accept your repentance. Allah wants to do so. We only have to show the repentance and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept it. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also reminded us of how much Allah loves to forgive. When Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what should I say on Laylatul Qadr? On the holiest night of the year, what should I say? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, you should say, O oh Allah, you are the afu, the one who erases sins. And you love to forgive sins. Allahumma innaka afuun tuhibbul afwa. Allah loves to forgive sins. Allah loves to forgive sins. So, O oh Allah, you are the one who is afu and you love to forgive. Therefore, forgive my sins as well. In fact, brothers and sisters, one of the biggest sins that we can do is to give up hope of Allah's forgiveness. To claim that Allah cannot forgive me is a bigger sin than any other sin that you have done. Let me repeat that. To claim that Allah cannot forgive me. I am too sinful. There is no point in repenting. Allah cannot forgive me. I am too sinful. This very claim of yours is a bigger sin than anything else you might have done as a Muslim. No questions about it. Why and how so? O oh Muslim, no matter how sinful you are, do you think that you alone, single-handedly, have committed so many sins that you can encompass Allah's mercy? That Allah's mercy cannot forgive you? That you can challenge the Rahman and the Rahim? That you can say, I am so sinful, Allah's Rahmah. Who are you and what are your sins in comparison to the mercy of Allah? To claim that I am so sinful, Allah cannot forgive me. That arrogance is a greater crime and a greater sin than any other sin that you might have done. And that is why the Prophet ﷺ said, the biggest of all sins is shirk. To worship another god, to worship an idol, the biggest of all sins is shirk and to give up hope of Allah's mercy and to say that Allah cannot forgive me. These are the biggest sins to commit shirk with Allah and then to claim Allah cannot forgive me. 
To claim Allah cannot forgive you, you are limiting the mercy of Allah. You are limiting the forgiveness of Allah. And you are claiming single-handedly that you and your sins are more powerful than Allah and His mercy. And that in and of itself, as we said, is a greater sin than any other sin you might possibly have committed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala challenges us in the Qur'an, reminds us in the Qur'an, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا Say, O oh my servants who have committed sins against themselves, O oh you who have lived your life in evil, O oh you who have not prayed regularly, O oh you who are involved in drugs and women and alcohol and all of the evils on earth, do not give up hope of Allah's mercy. This is a verse in the Quran addressed to sinners, addressed to evil people, evil Muslims. O oh you who are sinners, do not give up hope of Allah's mercy. Allah can forgive all sins, no exceptions, even the sin of shirk. Allah forgives it when somebody repents. Even the sin of shirk, Allah forgives it when somebody repents. And how do you repent from shirk? By restating your shahada and never returning to that shirk again. Even the sin of shirk, Allah can forgive it. If a person converts to Islam, his shirk is forgiven, is it not? If a Hindu, a Christian, any person accepts Islam, the shirk he has done is all forgiven. Similarly, if a Muslim commits shirk, he must say the shahada again. And with that shahada, repent, and even that shirk will be forgiven. How about the sins lesser than that? Brothers and sisters, there is no question that Allah's forgiveness and Allah's mercy can encompass all of the creation and even more so. You all know of the famous hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, where he said that the Prophet Musa السلام, was with the famous Khidr. Khidr, by the way, was a prophet of Allah. Some people think he was some mystical saint. This is not true. Khidr was another prophet. And Musa was also a prophet. And the two prophets were sent to different peoples. It is not possible for a wali of Allah to be higher than a prophet of Allah. When Musa is coming to learn from Khidr, this means Khidr is already a prophet. And Khidr has knowledge that Musa does not have. And that is why Khidr did what he did. And that is another topic in and of itself. When Musa was with Khidr, and Khidr was riding on that ship that the story is mentioned in the Quran, he dipped his finger into the ocean and pulled it out. And he asked Musa, how much water do you think my finger decreased from the ocean? Musa said, nothing. What has your water decreased from the ocean? And Khidr replied, such is the mercy of Allah. Such is the mercy of Allah and the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That all of the creation cannot detract, cannot subtract, cannot reduce the mercy and the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just like my finger cannot reduce the ocean's water. Such is the mercy of Allah that no person should ever despair of it. But the question arises, how then, how do we go about this process of tawbah? What is the proper methodology of tawbah? The proper methodology of tawbah is very simple. A number of steps, memorize them, very simple. The first step in our procedure for tawbah, the first step is that we must repent for the sake of Allah. We don't repent because somebody saw us doing an action. We don't repent because we were caught red-handed. We repent for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second condition is that we must feel guilty in our hearts. Brothers and sisters, feeling guilty is a sign of Iman. Feeling guilty is a sign you have some faith. If you didn't have any faith, you wouldn't feel guilty. So when you feel guilty, at least thank Allah that you have that much Iman that you feel guilty. No doubt if you had higher Iman, you wouldn't even commit the sin in the first place. But to feel guilty is a necessary requirement of repentance. The Prophet ﷺ said, feeling guilty is the essence of tawbah. Feeling guilty is the heart, is the crux of repentance. The third thing that we must do is to seek forgiveness with our tongues like we have with our heart. And we do this by saying, Oh Allah, I have sinned, forgive me. Astaghfirullah, 
atubu ila Allah Allahumma innaka afuwun tuhibbu al-afwa fa'fu anni dozens and dozens of dua rabbi ighfirli rabbi adhnabtu dhanban faghfirli so many duas and if you don't know arabic say it in your tongue say it in your mother tongue allah knows all languages and allah azza wa jal wants to see your spirit and your heart and not the verbal things that you utter if you don't know the arabic say it in your mother tongue oh allah i have sinned forgive me oh allah you are the forgiving you are the merciful if you don't have repentance if you don't forgive me there is no other being who can forgive me so there must be followed up by a verbal act of repentance the fourth point is that we need to make an intention to stop the sin if you steal money from somebody and then you meet him the next and you say oh i'm sorry i have stolen your money but in your heart you want to steal more money from them the same day what type of repentance is this it is not a full repentance it is not an admittance of guilt rather you must make an intention not to return to that sin and it is important to note that you make an intention not to return. If you do return to that sin, that does not disqualify your previous repentance. Because Allah judges by intention. If you return to that sin again, you must repent again. And your first repentance is valid. And if you return a third time, then you repent a third time. And if you return a fourth time, you repent a fourth time. And if you return again and again and again, you repent again and again and again. An infinite cycle until you meet your Lord on the Day of Judgment. This is a tactic of shaitan, a plot of shaitan, that shaitan sometimes, for example, some of us might be addicted to a sin, whether it's drinking, whether it's taking drugs, whether it's smoking, whatever the sin might be, we're addicted to it. So we repent one day and we feel guilty and we say, Oh Allah, that's it, that is the last drink I will ever have. Never again will I return to that sin. A day goes by, a week goes by, a month goes by, three months go by, and then shaitan comes and you slip and you drink again. You feel guilty, you repent again, and you say, that's it, the last time. This time, instead of three months, you slip in two months. And you go back to the alcohol again. But you return again to repentance. This time, instead of two months, in one month, you return to the alcohol. Now shaitan comes to you and says, you know what? Forget it. You're not going to be a good Muslim ever. You might as well just drink and enjoy life. Worry about the hereafter later on. Don't worry about repentance now. You're always an evil person. You see, the person was being righteous and good until this thought came to him. Had he died in any of those previous states, Allah would have accepted his repentance. But if he were to die in this state, here is where he would be a major sinner. Let me ask you a question. When a child is learning how to walk, does the child count how often it falls? Does the child fall for the first time, then stand up, second time, then stand up, third time, then says, you know, forget it, I'm never going to learn to walk. I'll crawl as long as I live. Or does the child continually try over and over and over and over again until the child finally perfects the art of walking? And even as an adult, does any amongst us ever not trip? Do we still not trip once in a while? What do we do after we've tripped 10, 20,000 times in our lives? Do we just lie in the dust and say, forget it, I'm never going to walk again? Or do we stand up, brush the dust off of ourselves and continue walking? And if we trip again, what do we do? We stand up and we continue walking. Such is the way with repentance. Such is the way with tawbah. Such is the way with istighfar. Allah does not count the number of times you repent. Allah looks at the quality of your tawbah and not the quantity of your tawbah. Allah looks at the quality of your guilt, the quality of your repentance, and not the quantity of the number of times you have asked Him. O Muslims, O Muslims, never lose hope of Allah's forgiveness. The conditions of tawbah, number one, sincerity. Number two, feeling regret and remorse. Number three, seeking Allah's forgiveness verbally. Number four, making an intention never to return to that sin. And there is a fifth condition if the sin involved another human being. If you stole some money, if you backbited about a person, if you slandered a person, then along with these four conditions, you also have to seek forgiveness from that other person.
Because you have wronged him and you have also wronged yourself and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you have stolen somebody's money, then you must return that money to him. Or if you, you don't know who it was from, you embezzle some funds or something, you must get rid of that money and give it to the poor. Expecting no reward, it's not your money in the first place. But you need to make your right, you need to make your wrong into right again. And that fifth condition is only when you have committed a sin with another person, another human being. Once you perfect your tawbah, what happens? Firstly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removes that sin. He erases it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives and He also erases the sin. You see, we forgive but we don't forget. If somebody wrongs you, even if you forgive him, in the back of your mind you remember, he did this to me, he did that to me, and you're always extra cautious. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives and He erases the sin. No sin is left after the repentance. The Prophet wasallam said, the one who repents from a sin, it is as if he has never committed the sin in the first place. The one who repents from the sin, it is as if he has never committed the sin in the first place. The second thing that happens after you perfect your tawbah, this is amazing brothers and sisters, pay attention to this. When you sin and you repent, Allah substitutes your evil with a good deed. You get rewarded for committing a sin. You will get rewarded for the sin you have done. Not because of the sin, but because of the tawbah. Allah says in the Quran, إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمِلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا فَأُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتٍ Whoever repents and does good deeds, Allah will substitute, will exchange for the evil that he has done. Allah will give him a good deed in its place. You will be rewarded for the sins you have done as long as you repent from those sins. The third thing that Allah promises to the repentant is Allah promises him extra blessings in this world. Extra money, extra children and wealth and health. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises those who repent that they will be blessed with the good of this world along with the hereafter. And you can read this in the story of the Prophet Nuh alayhi salam. The Prophet Nuh alayhi salam told his people, فَقُلْتُ اسْتَغْفِرُ رَبَّكُمْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ غَفَّارًا I told my people to seek Allah's forgiveness. Allah is the one who forgives. When you forgive, when you ask Allah's forgiveness, what happens? يُرْسِلِ السَّمَاءَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِدْرَارًا Allah will send the rain upon you with beautiful rain. And Allah will increase your money and increase your children. And Allah will give you many gardens and Allah will give you many rivers under them. When you repent, Allah will bless you with the blessings of this world. And the final blessing that we will mention is that repentance. Repentance is a cause for entering paradise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, the only people who will enter paradise are those who have done tawbah. The only people, illa man tawbah, except those who do tawbah, wa amana wa amina salihan, fa'ula'ika yadkhuluna jannah. They will be the ones who will enter jannah. O Muslims, O Muslims, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if you were to stop committing sins, if you were to stop committing sins, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would get rid of you. Listen to this hadith, amazing hadith. If you were to stop committing sins, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would get rid of you and bring forth a group of people who commit sins. Why? Does Allah love sinners? No. Allah does not love sinners. What did the Prophet ﷺ say? He would bring a group of people who commit sins so that they could ask Allah's forgiveness and so that Allah could then forgive them. Allah does not love sins, but Allah loves to forgive. Allah does not love the sinner, but Allah loves the repenter. And to be a repenter, you must be a sinner before you reach the stage of repentance. I conclude this talk by quoting a beautiful hadith, a beautiful hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, where he said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said that on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will draw close to the believer and cover him up, cover him up in a private covering that nobody can be between them. And Allah will ask him, 
did you not do this sin? And the believer will say yes. And Allah will say, did you not do this sin? The believer will say yes. And Allah will continue to count each and every sin until the believer thinks that he has been destroyed. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will then tell him, just as I hid these sins from the other people in this world, so too today I shall hide them up from the eyes of all. Just like your sins were private, just like you used to keep your sins between you and me and ask me for forgiveness, so too today I shall cover up all of your sins and erase them and you will not be called for them. And that very person will enter the garden of paradise. O oh Muslims, Allah does not count the quantity of your sins. Allah does not count how often you turn to Him. In a hadith Qudsi, the Prophet wasallam said that when a sinner commits a sin, he raises his hands to Allah and he says, Oh Allah, forgive me. Allah says to the angels, Look, my, sin, my servant has sinned, I have forgiven him. The servant commits the sin the second time. He raises his hands to Allah and says, Oh Allah, forgive me. The angels once again are told, Look at my servant, he has sinned and I have forgiven him. And then the servant commits the sin for the third time. What does Allah say? Does he say this is a sinner, hopeless? No. He tells the angels, Oh my angels, I bear witness that you testify that I have forgiven this servant no matter what he does. Why? Because he recognizes that I am his Lord, that he has sinned and that he must turn to me for forgiveness. That is what Allah wants from us, to recognize him to be the Lord, to turn to him for forgiveness. O Muslims, turn to the Ghaffar, turn to the Ghafoor, turn to the Rahman, turn to the Rahim. And when you do so, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept your repentance and bless you in this world and the hereafter. That is the true courageous man. That is the real sinner. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us to be amongst those who repent from the sins and accept that repentance and resurrect us on the day of judgment in the company of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala di muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum brothers and sisters. At this time I would like to quickly go through the instructions for questions and answers. So please everyone focus and pay attention, especially my volunteers. We have three microphones stationed in the audience for questions, one in the rear for brothers, in the front here for brothers, and one in the sister section. We will go in a, hopefully a clockwise fashion. When you approach the mic to ask a question, please do not bunch up, but stand in a queue. Wait your turn, state your name, your occupation, and then your question. Written questions receive second priority. I would ask the volunteers, and I would also ask all of the Muslims in attendance tonight, to please allow non-Muslims to have first preference at the microphone. And, and that's both in the sister section and the men's section. Brothers, if there is a non-Muslim, he has the priority, so please allow him to ask his questions. You have many opportunities to ask yours. I don't want to waste any time, so I'm going to begin with the microphone in the back for the brothers section. The rear mic in the brothers section, if you have a question. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Kashif al -Haq. I'm an ex-fashion designer and now a businessman. I have sincere question since what you said in the lecture that uh, no sinner can challenge the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Does this mean that Iblis, who, is, who has a guaranteed uh, position in the hellfire in the days in Akhirah, has he any opportunity? Has he got any opportunity for him to repent? <laughs> the topic that you have actually asked about deals more with Qadr, predestination. Uh, and that is something that is really a very detailed topic. Suffice to state that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His infinite knowledge has already known that certain beings such as Abu Lahab, when Allah revealed Tabbat yada Abi Lahab in Watab, Abu Lahab was still healthy and alive. And the surah was being recited for many years. And if he wanted to, he could have said, I'm a Muslim, now what are you going to do? 
That would have been a big contradiction that Allah has said in the Quran that Abu Lahab is going to go to the fire of hell. And if Abu Lahab had accepted Islam, this would have been a big contradiction. But Allah knew Abu Lahab would never accept Islam. Similarly for Iblis, Allah Azza wa Jal in his infinite knowledge already knows the status of Iblis. And so Allah Azza wa Jal has told us that Iblis is going to be destined to the fire of hell along with Fir'aun and all of these specific beings. So theoretically there is no being that is beyond Allah's forgiveness if that being repents. But realistically and practically, Allah has informed us of certain people who are not going to repent. And of them is Iblis. Thank you for your question, brother. I will now go to the sister section. Inshallah, if you have another question, just wait in the queue. And if your turn comes again, you can ask your second question. I would remind the audience, non-Muslims have preference. If you came with a non-Muslim guest, please do encourage him to ask his question to qualified uh, lecturers. Sister. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Sophie and I'm a student. My question is regarding the point you made about how if your sin was directed at, against a person, if it's hurt someone else, you're supposed to go and ask forgiveness from that person. Now, suppose you have backbit or slandered that person, going and telling that person that I said such and such a thing about you would hurt that person. So can you keep it yourself? You said that on the last day, Allah will take you in his embrace and tell you, I've hidden this fault of yours. Can you take it in such a way that Allah will hide that fault of yours? That's a very good question. Um, basically, obviously in the talk that I gave, I can only go into so much tangents and I wish I could go longer in this regard. But basically, if you have done a sin against another person and to publicize it will actually be more problematic such as you have slandered somebody in a gathering and it's already gone by, it's been a year, two years, few months and that's it, end of deal. In this case, what you need to do is after you seek Allah's forgiveness and all the other conditions the people who were present in the gathering that you slandered you need to make sure that they realize that you spread a lie or you said something wrong and you should praise the brother or the sister that you spoke about in the exact opposite way that you slandered him to make sure you get rid of the evil that you have done. So if you have said that such and such a person, uh, you know, steals and this was a lie, you should now go to the same gatherings with the same people and say he is an honest person, he is a person who would not do this and that. You need to make up for the crime that you have done in a way that doesn't get you into trouble. So you don't have to publicize it or go to him. Also, you can go to that person, a brother or the sister that you have uh, wronged and ask in general terms, if I have ever done anything to hurt you, please forgive me. So this is a general thing. And so he will say or she will say, inshallah, you are forgiven. And you say the same, anything that you have done as well inadvertently, I have forgiven you. So this is an act that generally speaking, you have had the sin forgiven. This is the way to get out of it. Jazakallah for the question. Jazakallah for the question. Again, I'm looking for any questions from non-Muslim guests. If not, we'll go to the rear mic on the brothers section. Could you please state your name and occupation? I'm Dr. Muhammad Minnatullah. I'm a practicing doctor. Is there any way by which we can recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts our repentance and also our good deeds in this life? This is a very intelligent question. May Allah reward you for asking it. The short answer is yes and no. <laughs> okay, yes and no. No, because no Muslim can ever guarantee that Allah has forgiven him. To say this, you are basically saying, I'm a person of Jannah. And that's not something that any Muslim should say. But yes, in the sense, you should expect and hope. There is a big difference between hoping and guaranteeing. You should hope and expect that, inshallah, Allah will indeed forgive me. And the sign for this is that you live a better life after your repentance than you did before your repentance. This is the sign. If you have been a sinner for a number of years and then you repent, the future after that repentance should be a better future. And that is a very positive sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has accepted the repentance. Also, to feel always scared, what if Allah punishes me? What if Allah holds me to task? This is a sign of Iman. If you ever forget being scared of Allah, if you ever feel safe, Allah will forgive me, no question about that. This is a sign that you have gone very low. And this is a way to phrase it is as follows. Iman is inversely proportional. 
The actual level of Iman is inversely proportional to the level that you think you have. In other words, the more Iman you actually have, the less Iman you think you have. And the less Iman you have, the more confident you have a lot of Iman. Okay, you are an engineer or a scientist, you understand inverse proportionality, right? So the more Iman you have, the more scared you are, Allah will not forgive me. And that is a sign of Iman. And the less Iman you have, you say, Allah is Ghafoor, Allah is Rahman, He will forgive me. That's not a part of Iman. So we're always hopeful of Allah's mercy and fearful of Allah's punishment. And inshallah, that is the sign that Allah has accepted your repentance. Thank you for the question. We will now go to the front mic, brother section. If we have a question, brother in the front, could you please state your name and your question? I'm Abdul Rahim, uh, I'm a chemical engineer. My question is, uh, I read in a fatwa of uh, Sheikh uh, Salih and Munajid Rahimahullah that um, it is not good to pledge to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that um, uh, I, won't, uh, I will never go back, to, I mean, I promise that uh, I will never return to the sin. Because uh, there is every possibility that we may uh, return to the sin. So, but uh, I would like to know if we have returned to the sin, now, even after making a pledge and if you fail to uh, fulfill that pledge, how should we repent this time? You see, there is a difference between promising, making an oath never to return, and making an intention never to return. If you make an intention, this is what is required. But when you make an oath binding upon yourself, you have placed yourself in a little bit of a predicament. What if you do return to the sin? And that is why you should not place an oath. I swear by Allah, I will never return to the sin. How do you know? You might. Rather, you should make an intention. Oh Allah, help me not to return to the sin. Oh Allah, make it easy upon me not to return to the sin. Oh Allah, make this the last sin that I do of that you know, type of sin that I'm doing. This is the difference. If you have made an oath upon yourself, and you have given a qasam and a solemn oath by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in this case you need to expiate the oath, and that is done by feeding 10 people, or giving them uh, 10 garments of the, to the poor, or uh, by freeing a slave, which cannot be done in our times. So you, you expiate the oath by giving 10 poor people their food to eat, or to give them clothes to wear. And this will expiate that one oath. But don't return to it again. Make an intention, but don't make an oath. That's the difference between the two. We'll go to the rear mic, brothers section. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, brother. Um, my question is something related to repentance. And uh, you had spoken about the methodology. Especially in the subcontinent, a lot of muftis uh, talk about the prayer of repentance, which is salatul tawbah. Now, my question is, is there authentic evidence from the authentic sunnah which actually permits this prayer? Or is it an innovative practice or, you know, I want you to answer that question. You see, generally speaking, one of the signs of a good repenter is that he increases the good deeds that he does. Therefore, when you repent, it is very good to also do some extra good deeds, whether it's dhikr, whether it's reading Qur'an, whether it's remembering Allah, whether it is an extra prayer. I don't know of anything called Salatu Tawbah that the Prophet ﷺ told us to do. But at the same time, generally speaking, if you were to do a good deed after you repent, then this is definitely within the Sunnah and definitely following the spirit of Islam. But make sure you realize any good deed, even to do wudu after you commit a sin, even to do wudu is something very good. And this is something that we should strive to do. Anytime we commit a sin, we should try to weigh up that sin with a good deed. In other words, make an equivalent. If we did something wrong, do something good. And if it is two raka'at, excellent as well. So whatever you do, whether it's dhikr, Quran, tahajjud, two raka'at, saying, feeding the poor, giving charity, anything that you do is a good sign of repentance. And Allah knows best. Go ahead, sister. Please state your name and occupation. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Nasima. I'm coming from Coimbatore. I'm a homemaker. Uh, if we make repentance for others who make sin, how is that accepted by Allah? And what is the reward we get for making repentance for others who make sin? You see, you cannot make repentance on behalf of a specific sin of any other person. Only repentance may be done for yourself. What you may do is ask Allah to forgive. And there's a difference between repentance and forgiveness. Repentance is, I have committed a sin, forgive me. 
Forgiveness is, oh Allah, forgive all the Muslims. Oh Allah, forgive all my parents. Oh Allah, forgive my grandparents. This is forgiveness. You make dua for forgiveness for all the Muslims, no problem. But repentance can only be done for yourself and your own sins. Tawbah is individual. You cannot, unfortunately there's a habit in some places, you go to the Mulvi, you go to the Sheikh, you go to the Peer for repentance. This is a Catholic practice, it's not an Islamic practice. The Peer and the Sheikh and the Mulvi cannot forgive you, only Allah can forgive you. So when you commit a sin, you need to turn directly to Allah. Don't go to any person. When you commit a sin, you raise your hands to Allah. Like you disobeyed Allah with your own hands, now you must raise your hands to Allah and say, Oh Allah, forgive me. But as any Muslim, you can seek forgiveness for other Muslims. Oh Allah, increase my reward of my parents. Oh Allah, forgive so and so. Oh Allah, forgive my teacher who taught me this and this subject many years ago. Oh Allah, forgive the Muslims. Oh Allah, forgive. This is something that is good. But that's different. Repentance must be individual, forgiveness may be for the general public. And what is the rewards of forgiveness? There are many. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us that we should seek forgiveness for all the Muslims. And the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever asks something for another person, an angel will say, may you be given the same. So when you say, oh Allah, forgive so and so, an angel comes and makes the same dua for you. And may you also be forgiven. So it is good to seek forgiveness for other people. But we don't make it a habit, much less charge money or give money for this. This is something we do for those whom we love and for our close ones and relatives. As for tawbah, this is individual. I do tawbah for me and you do tawbah for you. There cannot be any passing overs of tawbahs. Thank you for your question, sister. We are now going to the front mic, male section. Brother, could you please state your name and occupation again? My name is Kashif al -Haq. I'm a designer by profession. Before, now I'm a businessman. My question, this time with regards to the addictive sins, from the perspective of student of knowledge or when it comes from the scholars especially, with respect to your Iman, prior to making sin, when your conscience prevents you from it, but somehow your weaknesses has made you slip off and you have committed it. And when you go into making toba, there comes a guilty conscience that you know it well. You have so much of knowledge from the Quran and the Hadith, everything has prevented you. But knowingly you did it that Allah might forgive my sin because He's most merciful. But when I make or when anyone makes his uh, Tawbah sincerely, that is truthful, not fictitious, it's not hypocrisy. I would like to know with this kind of repentance, can this come under the category of true repentance or hypocrisy? This is a very deep question and it really depends on the mentality of the one who is committing the sin. You see, a true believer should always be conscious of Allah's names and attributes. And so if this true believer falls into a sin and in the back of his mind he is feeling really guilty and he is saying, Oh Allah, I know I'm doing a sin. Oh Allah, you are the Rahman, forgive me. Then this is a sign of Iman. What do you expect? You want him to forget about Allah's mercy? No, he should always be conscious of it. At the same time, another person, he becomes confident in Allah's mercy. Oh, Allah is Rahman, Allah is Ghafoor, Allah will forgive me. You see that arrogance is what is the sin here not the affirmation of Allah's mercy. So it goes back to your psychology. If your psychology is that of submission and feeling guilty, this is a sign of Iman. If your psychology is that of arrogance and confidence, this is a sign of hypocrisy. And I hope that clarifies the point, inshallah. Thank you for the question. We are now going to resume our correct order by going to the rear mic male section. Would you please have your questioner state his name and occupation? There's a question from a non-Muslim friend whose name is Vikram, is an auditor by profession. His question, for me, each demigod is manifestation or quality of ultimate truth. By worshipping the demigod, I am worshipping the ultimate god. How this can be a sin? Your question goes back to the very concept of godhood. What does it mean to be a God? By definition, a God must be all perfect in and of himself. 
by definition, a God must be all perfect in and of himself. If there are more than one God, if there are two gods, Allah says in the Quran, if there is more than one God, the two gods or the many gods would fight one another and there would be chaos in this earth. That each God would be wanting this and the other God would be destroying that. The very fact that the creation is in such harmony is an indication there is one all-powerful God. And this one all-powerful God who has many, many infinite attributes, the attribute of mercy, the attribute of knowledge, the attribute of power, all of these attributes must exist within the very one entity of God. God cannot separate His knowledge from His power, from His mercy, or else that would be separate gods. All of these attributes must be encompassed and contained within the very one essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is where Muslims differ with many polytheists. Many polytheists, such as you yourself in this question, you say we affirm one God, but each deity represents one power of God. So there is the deity that represents destruction, the deity that represents mercy, the deity that represents creation. But the reality is, these are all separate deities. They cannot be one deity, nor can they represent one deity. Because the, the God of destruction is not the God of mercy. The God of power cannot be the God of knowledge. It must be all encompassed in one for there to be one ultimate God. Similarly, to draw an image of God, to draw a caricature of God, to draw some type of icon of God, this in and of itself is something that our religion prohibits. How can you draw a structure of God when you don't even know what God looks like? God is not like anything that we know. Allah says in the Quran, there is nothing similar to Him. For you to imagine something being a God, you have made your God into a human structure or an animal structure. Thus, by this very deed, you have disqualified this God from being a God. God must be something that the mind cannot encompass, cannot understand. If you can understand this God and draw Him, He cannot be a God anymore. So by drawing God and by carving out God, it cannot be a God. Similarly, when you make a God with your own hands, the Prophet Ibrahim, Abraham, the Prophet Ibrahim says, how can you worship that which you yourself have created? How can you worship this being? You say this is the image of God. But the reality is your veneration, your worship, your sacrifices are presented to this rock, to this stone, to this solid entity in front of you. When you bow down in front of it, tell me in all honesty, when you bow down in front of this God, where does your heart go? It goes to this image, it goes to this icon, it does not go to the one almighty, all-powerful God who cannot be shown in any, any image. And that is why in Islam, there are no images of God. In Islam, we cannot draw any God. Rather, we bow down to Allah and our hearts go up to Allah, but we do not imagine Allah. We cannot imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So really, your question goes back to a much more deeper question. What does it mean to be a God? We as Muslims have a different answer. And polytheists and idol worshippers have a different answer. And you, as somebody who does believe in a multitude of gods, you need to ask yourself, what does it mean to be a God? And that question, you will answer your own question in this regard. Is there a follow-up question to that question? If so, please come to the mic. Good evening. Once again, I'm Satish over here. I have one uh, question related to the question the brother has put forth. And as we believe in Hindu philosophy, to concentrate on God, we don't know who is the, the direct concept to reach the Almighty. So we have certain symbol or aid to do concentrate towards that particular thing. So we have semi-gods. Actually, it's the wrong concept of having semi-god. We have any one particular target to concentrate our view towards it. So we do that. But once we realize that we have reached towards the Almighty, so we throw all these things and directly walk towards the thing. I can put a small example if you permit me for a second. As we travel towards the seashore, we see the tides are coming up. As you go deep towards the sea, we don't see the tides. The same thing we do it to enter into the world of or to the uh, Bhakti Yuga or we call about the spiritual concept. We need certain things to travel. So we make use of this ideal worshipping and all. But that's completely wrong. Once we realize that we have to go through. How about you feel, sir? The first thing I want to say is that these analogies, right, for example, of the tidal waves or other people have other analogies, we can never use any analogy to extrapolate it to theology. Because I can give you another analogy, and a third person, the Christian, will come with the Trinitarian analogy, 
our religion is not based upon any analogy. Our religion is based upon what Allah tells us, what God tells us. It cannot be based upon metaphorical conceptions or beautiful images. Your point being that you need a point of concentration. You see, in this point of concentration, you have created another entity, whether you call it a God or not. There is no point of concentration that is worthy of that concentration. There is no entity that deserves that dedication, that it deserves, deserves that sacrifice. By your own testimony, you have admitted this is a figment of the imagination. It doesn't exist. Then why do you need it? When it doesn't exist, why have it in the first place? And here is where Islam differs from other religions. When we know Allah is the only deity, is the only God, is the only creator. Waves, we don't need these fictitious middlemen. We turn to Allah directly. And that is the perfection of monotheism. You see, firstly you are saying as well that the elite amongst the Hindus, they will jump over to the reality. Fine, maybe that is true. How about the masses and masses and masses? How about 99% of them? Have they reached this 1% that the elite of the Brahmin priests have understood? No. Why? Because they have created false entities that they have called gods. And the majority of mankind, even if this concept be true, which it is not, the majority of mankind will not be so philosophical. And that is why Islam tells us to be practical, pragmatic, realistic. Don't even put up delusional gods. Don't even put up illusional idols. Turn to Allah directly and don't worry about these intermediaries that by your own testimony are figments of the imagination. This is the beauty of Islam. La ilaha illallah. There is no deity worthy of worship except for Allah, the ultimate deity. Thank you for the question. If there's a, no follow-up to that, we'll go to the sister section. Sisters, do you have a question? Please state your name and occupation. This is again a question on behalf of another sister. Question is, if we hurt or abuse a non-Muslim brother or sister, do we seek forgiveness from them? Brothers and sisters, we are Muslims. We are Muslims. We are not like other religions that have a double standard. We are Muslims. To steal from a Muslim is a sin. To steal from a Hindu is a sin. To steal from a Christian is a sin. To backbite a Muslim is a sin. To backbite a Christian is a sin. To backbite a Hindu is a sin. It doesn't matter what the ethnicity or the gender or the religion of the other person is. The laws of Islam are applicable upon you. Just because a person is another faith doesn't mean you can abuse and misuse them. Doesn't mean you can transgress against their rights. This is the beauty of our religion. We don't have double standards. What we do to Muslims, we do to non-Muslims. Therefore, if you have done something against a non-Muslim, you must also ask for their forgiveness and you must make it up in this world. And this is a part and parcel of our religion. Being honest to Muslims and to non-Muslims together. Thank you for the question. We will now go to the rear mic brothers section. Could you please state your name and occupation? And again, if there are any non-Muslims in the audience, you are more than welcome to ask your question and uh, please don't feel too shy or too humble. We are still your brothers here. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Akhtar Habibi Shah. I'm a lecturer in English, Muhammad Sadaq College of Arts and Science. So throughout your speech, you emphasize that mercy of God is boundless. I don't know the source of this saying, what Allah says to Prophet. He admonishes the Prophet, be aware of Satan. Perhaps you misguide you by saying that I am merciful. If it is a case, then it becomes a paradoxical. Can you repeat the question? I didn't understand it. Throughout your speech, you said that Allah's mercy is boundless. I don't know the source of this saying where Allah says to Prophet, O oh Prophet, be aware. Perhaps Satan may misguide you by telling that I am merciful. No, this is not an authentic hadith. I can guarantee you this much. This is not an authentic hadith and it contradicts hundreds of verses in the Quran and hundreds of hadith of the Prophet wasallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala proclaims that I am the merciful, I am the forgiver, I am the one who erases sins. How can Satan misguide you by affirming what Allah has for himself? But we said, what is problematic is to feel confident that yes, Allah will forgive me no matter what I do. The problem is the confidence and not affirming that Allah is merciful. 
The problem is the guarantee that yes, I am, not, for whatever I do, Allah will forgive me regardless of who I am and what I have done. That is the problem. The problem is arrogance and not affirming the mercy of Allah. But the hadith as you have stated, it is uh, definitely not an authentic hadith. Brother for the question. We will now come to the front mic. Brother section, could you please state your name and occupation and briefly state your question. My name is Mansur Ahmad. I am a software professional. My question is, if I am backbiting a person and uh, I am realizing that I had did a mistake and before I am going to ask for the forgiveness from that person, he dies. And what is the condition for me? Once again, what is important is your intention. If you were sincere in your repentance, then if you could not ask his forgiveness, go to the people in front of whom you have backbited this person. Go to them and make sure that they realize that you have slandered or you have said something you should not say. And praise him. Just like you harmed him by your tongue, now cause him some good by your tongue. Praise him to the level or more than you have harmed him. And that is a requirement of the tawbah if you want it to be forgiven. Thank you for your question. We will now go to the sister section. Sister, could you please state your name and occupation and briefly state your question. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Afrin. I'm a student. My question is, on the basis of the hadith that you quoted, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala conceals the sins, secret sins of the person, then what about the sins which we committed earlier, but uh, out of ignorance we have disclosed this to others? But now we feel uh, regretted for that. Now my question is, still after this, can we have a hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will conceal our sin on the day of judgment or he will disclose it before others? My dear sister in Islam, no matter what you have done in the past, there is always hope of mercy. In the past, whatever you have done, there is hope of mercy. Worry about the present and the future. So whatever has happened, has happened. As Allah says, Allahu amma salaf. Allah has forgiven what has already passed. When you feel guilty for something that you have done in the past, Alhamdulillah, it will be forgiven. Worry about the present and the future. The, pre the present and the future with regards to this issue, the Prophet wasallam said, Allah will forgive everyone except those who openly talk about their sins. The Sahaba said, who are those people? The Prophet wasallam said, that is the person who did a sin at night and nobody saw him. And when it comes the next morning, he goes and tells the people, do you know I did this last night and I did this last night and I did this last night. In other words, a person is bragging and boasting about a sin. If you have done a sin, be ashamed of it between you and Allah and don't publicize it. It is a part of your iman that you feel ashamed of your sin and you want to hide it up and you don't want to tell the people. You don't brag and boast about your sins. And if, if you had done a sin in the past, that when you tell the people it will benefit them, then in this case it might be permissible to say. For example, a drug addict, a person who is addicted to alcohol, he has now repented. He wants to advise the people not to drink alcohol. In this case, the scholars say he should mention his sin so that he can warn the people. He should say, I know the dangers of being a drug addict. I was a drug addict. I know the dangers of alcohol. I used to drink alcohol. So when he says it like this, then the very sin becomes something he is ashamed of, not proud of. And so that is something he should tell the people to warn them in a more effective manner. What is prohibited is to be proud of your sin. When you're proud of your sin, that is when the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah will never forgive somebody like that. And I hope that answers the question, inshaAllah. Brothers and sisters, I would thank you for attending this first session with Brother Yasir Qadi. Spread the word, oh man. Spread the word of Islam